So all motion will actually have some form of resistance. And it's always in the opposite direction to which you're traveling. Right? So once you've defined where your resultant is going to go, which way is going to be positive, resistance will be in the opposite direction, will be in the negative direction. Okay. That was Newton's third law. Balances out. When you think about it, there's only a couple of cases we need to think of. If we're thinking of straight line motion, <coughs> horizontal motion, vertical motion, one might be when we go up, one might be when we go down. And really that's all because any other angle we can do vectors and break every, like we do projectile motion, we can break it up into horizontal and vertical. It's all right, there's good old Bob. Travelling in a horizontal line and to the right. So I've made the resultant force going to the right. That means resistance must be going to the left. And in a, a problem like this, Unless they tell me there's other forces on this particle, then that's it. So we'd end up with some sort of an equation like that. mx double dot is negative r. Well, divide by m, so we've got an acceleration equation, then we go and integrate whatever the equation is and so on. Now, if we were going upwards, so Bob's going up, there's my resultant force. Resistance and also the force due to gravity will be going down. So we'd end up with something like this. mx double dot is minus mg minus the resistance. Divide through by the mass, we'd get some sort of an acceleration equation there. Look, the physics doesn't change. If you have to find things like the greatest height, it's still going to happen when velocity is equal to zero, and things like that. Downwards has to be treated differently now if we're thinking about resistance, because my resultant force, I'm now going to say, is going down. So actually, down is going to be the positive direction now. And the force due to gravity will be going down, but resistance is always in the opposite direction. So this time, in this sort of problem, I'll get that the resultant force is mg minus r. So the mg is positive in this case, because it's in the same direction as I've defined the resultant to be. Divide through by m, and so on. That's really the only three cases. There's this thing when we're going down called terminal velocity. It is not the velocity with which you hit the ground. Some people think that because if you're falling from a great height, you hit the ground, it's usually pretty terminal. But that's not what terminal velocity is. Okay, so terminal velocity is simply when those forces balance, which means the acceleration at that point would be zero. All right, let's do a, a similar problem to the last one that we saw. We're going upwards, initial velocity this time, so I don't have to keep going little v, big v. We'll just call little u, that makes life easier. Assuming that the retardation due to this resistance is equal to kv squared. Find expressions for the greatest height at the time taken to reach that height. So the first thing I'm going to do is draw myself a force diagram. I'm saying, well, my resultant force is going up, because I'm travelling up. So I'll have mg going down. I mean, they haven't told me anything else for gravity, so I'll assume it's just g for gravity. Retardation is just kv squared. My initial conditions. Displacement equals zero, velocity is u. So there's my equation minus g minus k on m v squared. So v to v dx, I have acceleration in terms of velocity. So I don't really have a choice this time. I need something with a to v in it. Um, you might think, oh, to v to t, but that's not going to help me in this problem until the next bit. I'm trying to find the greatest height. I want displacement. So v to v dx, dx to v, turn it upside down separate my variables and I get the integral of dx is equal to, I'll take the constant out for the mass there, uh, v to v and mg plus kv squared. We said when displacement was zero, velocity was u. Uh, we want to know the displacement when velocity is zero, greatest height. So there's my answer. We just have to interpret what that answer is. 
displacement is m on 2k, the integral from naught to u, 2k v dv. So what I've basically done there is I've created derivative on function. So I've multiplied the top by 2k, which meant I had to divide by 2k out the front as well. But that means I have a log function. Sub in u, sub in 0, and eventually we get our answer playing with our log laws of m on 2k, the log of 1 plus ku squared on mg. So all right, there's our greatest height. Still haven't got a lot of numbers here, but... The next thing was to find how long it took. Rather than playing around with that, I'll go back to the acceleration equation. But this time, I'm going to simply call acceleration to v to t. Because I don't need to substitute in what that greatest height is. Again, I'll, I'll use the, the fact that I know the velocity is zero at that point. It's going to be easier. So integral of the t minus m outside to v on mg plus kv squared. This time, on the right-hand side, I've got an inverse trig function. In fact, inverse tan. Now, when I was doing inverse tan, remember, it was easier if I just had v squared, not kv squared. So I pulled out the k. Got to be real careful here. That means a squared in our standard integral, a squared is mg on k, which means a is the square root of mg on k. So I'm going to get m on k, 1 over, so square root of k on mg, inverse tan, square root of k on mg, times v. Looks awful, doesn't it? But it, the nice thing about this, certainly the second bit, when you substitute in zero there, all you've got is the inverse tan of zero, and the inverse tan of zero is zero. So really all we're doing is subbing in the u. And there is the time it takes. The square root of m on kg, the inverse tan of the square root of k on mg, times u. Ah. Let's have a look at this one. Body of mass 5 kilograms is dropped from a height at which the gravitational acceleration is g. Uh, we're going to assume the air resistance proportional to v, and they've told us that constant of proportion is going to be 1 8. Velocity after time t. We're going to come up with an equation for velocity after time t. Okay, this time Bob's going down. So my resultant force will be mx double dot, but they've told me the mass is uh, 5, so I might as well substitute that in there. 5x double dot. Gravity, force due to gravity will be 5g. Resistance is 1 8 v. So 1 8 v. Set up our equation. So the resultant force is 5g. If it's in the same direction, it's positive. If it's in the opposite direction, it's negative. G minus 1 on 40 V. We are trying to find velocity and time. Well, the thing that links velocity and time when we're talking about acceleration is dv to t. So we'll make it dv to t. I'll make it all one fraction because then it's going to be easier to separate my variables out. And there we go. We've got our solution. We just have to work out what it is. So the integral of the t, well, that's just t on the left-hand side. Right-hand side, we've got a log function. Should have negative 1 on the top. That's why I've ended up with negative 40 here. Sub in V, sub in G. Look, you can even, if you think about it, go straight from the third last step to the last step. Because you know your, your, your coefficient out the front is going to be the same. So you end up with a log minus log. Divide it. So the top of the fraction will be when I sub in V, the bottom of the fraction is when I sub in zero. But you'll notice I've turned it upside down and taken away the negative. So, woo. Right, so be careful though. So 40 log 40G on 40G minus V. But that is T in terms of V. They wanted V in terms of T. So now we just have to make V the subject of all this. Okay, to undo the log, exponentialize, if that is such a word. So there's e to the power of t on 40. Um, I want to get the v on the top of the fraction, so I've turned both sides upside down. That means it's now e to the power of minus t on 40. 
multiply by the 40G, isolate the V, I've decided to factorise it, and there we go. Velocity is 40G, 1 minus E to the power of minus T on 40. So what is the terminal velocity? Two ways now I can think about terminal velocity. Remember we said it occurs when acceleration is equal to zero? So I can go back to my acceleration formula and I get velocity is 40G. But now that I have a velocity time graph, I can work out terminal velocity. Because if you were to draw that picture, basically you're saying, what's the limit of that as t approaches infinity? What is the graph doing? Well, we know our exponential to the power of minus t on 40, so our negative exponential graph would be going down towards zero. So it'd be 40g times 1. So that's the other way we could do it if we have a velocity time equation. Let's find the displacement time equation. All right, remember we found out velocity was 40g, 1 minus e to the power of minus t on 40. Um, so I'll change velocity to dx to t. Again, separate out our variables, sub in the initial conditions that we knew, and we end up with, well, we're just integrating an exponential this time. And if we want to make it look fancy, this time I expanded the whole thing out. 40gt plus 1600ge G, to the power of minus 2 on 40. Uh, 1600g. 